Welcome to Westside Community Church. You're watching a message series titled, You Can Overcome Your Obstacles by Pastor John Clark. This is part six. We're still doing what we call, uh, You Can Overcome Your Obstacles. And we're on part six. And so if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 27. And then we're going to jump ahead to 1 Samuel chapter 30. And, and just to make you aware of what God is doing uh, through this message series, is we've been looking at the life of David from the time that he was anointed to be the king of Israel, somewhere in his early teens, to the day that he actually got the crown. And what most people don't realize is it took 22 years. Did you realize that? 22 years from the time he was anointed to be the king of Israel, 22 years before he actually got the crown, before he actually got to be the king. That's an amazing thing. And so we've been looking at the stories in between. And today in 1 Samuel 27, I just want to read the scripture and pray and ask God to bless it, and then, and then we're going to move on to chapter 30 because I believe there's some critical parts here. So if you've got your Bibles, take them and turn with me. Uh, we're going to look at just the first few verses, and um, if you don't, we'll have it on the screen. But here it is. It says this in verse uh, 1 of 1 Samuel chapter 27. So David and the 600 men left and went over to Achish, the son of Moak, king of Gath. And David, settled, uh, David and his men settled in Gath with Achish. Then David said to Achish, If I have found favor in your eyes... Please let a place be assigned to me in one of the country towns that I may live there. Let's pray and then I'll continue on. Father, I ask in Jesus' name that you'll bless your word, that God, you'll speak. Lord, I pray against distractions. I pray against the confusion of the enemy. And I pray against all the excitement and the changes today that we wouldn't lose focus on you. That you would be our number one thing. God, speak today. We desperately need to hear from you. God, we want, we want to find favor in your eyes. We're, we're, done, we're done finding favor in man's eyes. So we need your Holy Spirit to be the teacher of the hour. Speak, for your servants are listening. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. So there's the scripture we were on last week. And, and, and what's interesting about that passage of scripture is that David said, if I found favor in your eyes. He is talking to the son of a Philistine king. And if you're familiar with the scriptural story at all, if you've got any history in you, you know the Israelites' mortal enemy is the Philistines. David has left the safety and security of his homeland and he has traveled to the Philistine country. He's the next anointed king of Israel and he's hiding out in the enemy's territory. And when he's there, he says, if I found favor in your eyes, to, 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 a, to a foreign king's son, he's desperate to find favor. Remember, we talked last week about it, that his own father, Jesse, rejected him by not inviting him to be a part of the coronation to, to the calling of a king. And, and then Saul, the, the one he was trying to emulate himself after, Saul rejected him by throwing spears at him in death threats. And now David... Hungry to, to, to have some man in his life say, I like you, I approve of you, I accept you, I'm pleased with you. David comes close to, to Achish and said, if I found favor in your eyes, let a place be assigned to me. Give me anything, give me anywhere. I just want to belong. This is David's story. He said, if I found favor in your eyes, and we talked about the difference between the favor of man and the favor of God. For, for a lot of us, the favor of man is something that we have to achieve. We have to earn it. We talked about a good work ethic last week and how so many of us work so hard to, to get the favor of man, to, to have somebody be pleased with us. It, the favor of man is something that we achieve. We earn it. But the favor of God is something we receive. And we talked about in the closing of last week that the favor of God is easy to describe. And it's simply this. God noticed you before you did anything worth noting. You understand that God noticed you even before you did anything worth noting. We, we looked at all the biblical characters from the Bible, how many of them God found favor, they found favor in God's eyes and they hadn't even done a thing. Noah found favor in the eyes of God and he hadn't even built the ark yet. Abraham found favor in the eyes of God and he hadn't even gone up on, on the hill and he hadn't even gone to, to find the promised land. Moses had found favor in the eyes of God and he hadn't even led the children of Israel out of captivity. It, it's amazing. Jesus found favor in the eyes of God and he hadn't done one miracle and he hadn't died for humanity yet. God finds favor in you. He notices you even before you did anything worth noting. But I, but I want you to notice, before we move on, is that line there in about verse 3 or 4 where, where, where David says, let a place be assigned to me in one of the country towns that I, that I may live there. David is hungry to make a home somewhere. So guess what he found? We've got to look at 1 Samuel 27, verse 7. The Bible says in verse 7 that David lived in the Philistine territory of Ziklag, for one year and four months. 
There's where David found his home. Achish gave him this place called Ziklag. Ziklag doesn't, doesn't sound like all that great of a place, but it is a kind of a cool name, right? Where y'all from? I'm from Ziklag. I mean, that's a neat name, right? I mean, kind of carries some, ter- some, 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 uh, some uh, impression with us. Ziklag is where he lived. But here's what's interesting. As a student of God's word, I'm always fascinated with details. The Bible says here that he lived in Ziklag for one year and four months. That's odd to me, okay? Let me be honest with you, okay? One year and four months. Why didn't God say uh, uh, about a year and a half? He didn't. The Bible says one year and four months. It didn't say almost two years. It said one year and four months. It didn't say a, a little over a year. It said one year and four months. Why am I so passionate about this? Because do you know for a fact we don't even know exactly how old David was when he was anointed to be the king of Israel? We don't know. It does not say in the Bible that he was 16 years old. It said that he was a ruddy young man. And according to Hebrew culture, we know that somebody less than 20 and older than 12. And so we make him 16 years old. We got a guess at David's age. We don't even really know for a fact that it took 22 years other than looking at historical events from the time of, of Goliath's death up until when, when Saul died. We, we can calculate, we can estimate it's 22 years. That's how we get that number. We got to work out the magic to get the number. But God will give us dates and times when he wants us to learn something. He says... David lived in the Philistine territory of Ziklag for one year and four months. Wow, that's some detail. And why is that so critical? It's critical because what happens in this 16 months of David's life, I believe David will later in Scripture say to you, that was the worst decision I ever made. Now don't look at your spouse, okay? Don't look at him right now. But that was the worst decision, don't look at your kids either, I ever made, okay? Okay? Have you ever been there? Have you ever looked at your life and thought, man, that period of my life, from from that point all the way up to this point, that was one of the worst decisions I ever made. I should have never taken that job. I I should have never started the business. I should have never got engaged in that relationship. I should have never been friends with him. There was a period of time, and, and for David, God wants to note it. God wants to put details on it. He said it was one year and four months, 16 months of David's life would change him forever. I wonder if you're in the midst of that right now. I wonder if you've ever gone through that. I wonder, wonder if you have a period in your life where you're like, you know what? I'll never forget those two and a half years. I'll, I'll never forget those four months. I knew exactly what was happening. That was the worst decision I ever made. David has made a terrible decision. But we're going to talk about that today and, and what happens when you make a bad decision and then you begin to play it out. We're going to catch up with David about a year into the 16 months, okay? We're going to go to chapter 30. We're going to catch up with him about a year later. And then I want you to see what happens just a year into the worst decision David ever made. Let me give you some background before we get to chapter 30, okay? In chapter 27, the Bible says David thought to himself that he would, the best thing to do was to escape to the land of the Philistines. So he makes up his mind in chapter 27 he's going to escape. In chapter 28, David runs into a little bit of trouble and, and Saul is hunting him down. In chapter 29, David and, and, and his men, the 600 men with him, they assemble their forces and they begin to attack and raid the Amalekites. The Amalekites are another mortal enemy of the Israelites. David would raid them. He's trying to get favor with Achish and he would bring back all these goods and all these services and he would say, are you pleased with me now? Do you like me now? Do you approve of me now? Do you accept me now? David, David has been working for an evil king. He's been doing this in chapter 28 and chapter 29. In chapter 29, an interesting moment happens. Tell me if you've ever been in this situation. Achish, the the Philistine king's son, and all the commanders assemble the army, and do you know what they're about to do? They're going to go and attack Saul and the Israelites. The Philistines are ready to take the battle to the Israelites. They're ready to go fight to the death. And David and his 600 men, believe it or not, agree to go with them. David and his 600 men said, yeah, we'll fight on the side of the Philistines and we'll fight the people we know and we love. Can you imagine the the, the complexity of the situation? David is anointed the next king of Israel. He's but a year and a half away from getting the crown and he has assembled himself with the enemy and he's about to go attack Saul, the king of Israel. And men he has probably trained in battle, men he has fought with, men he has cried with, men he has served with, men he grew up with. David is about to take his sword and go kill those men. All because David has been living for the last year 
in a place called Ziklag. How twisted and messed up can we get, right? You ever met somebody? Don't look at yourself. But you ever met somebody who makes the stupidest decisions in the world? And, and, and you look at them and you're like, are you even thinking right? Sometimes we can get so messed up in our heads. Sometimes we can make the worst decisions because we've taken no counsel from anyone else. As I read the Bible, I find nowhere where David has consulted with anyone else but himself. He's about to go into battle and he's about to go fight his own people. How crazy is this? And so the Bible says that, that they traveled about three days north, about 55 miles. And while they're traveling, David and the 600 men who are with him, while they're traveling with Achish and the Philistine kings, the commanders stop and go, no, 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 hang on, hang on. David can't come with us. David can't come with us because, because we're concerned that in the midst of the battle against the Israelites, he may turn on us and kill us. Achish is like, no, man, he's cool, he's good, he's with us, and he's not going to be a problem, and don't worry about it. And, and the other commanders go, no, we can't go any further. David, you take your 600 men and you go back to Ziklag. They've already traveled three days on foot. I mean, I mean, they're already, David was all in. Isn't our God good that he'll spare us from our own stupidity and our own bad moves and our own decisions? God will spare us in the midst of us doing something very foolish and very silly. God comes in and spares us. Maybe you've never been ransomed. Maybe you've never been spared. But I look at my life and I realize I was heading this direction and it was the wrong direction. And my God came through in a heartbeat and he stopped it. He stopped me from doing something that could have changed my life forever. I praise God that he's a good God that he takes care of us. So David and his men, three days they've been walking. And the Bible says that they had to turn around and they had to walk three days back. Six days on the journey. So we catch up with the story that David and his men have been traveling on foot for six days. David's probably a little disappointed, but relieved. God got him out of a tricky situation. Exhausted emotionally and physically, David and his men come to Ziklag. Now, by the way, Ziklag means winding. It's about 50 miles from Jerusalem, uh, southwest of there. It's in the southern part of Judah. It's really uh, fertile land, but it's grazing land for animals. There's no major body of water. There's no major trade route. Ziklag is literally a country town out in the middle of nowhere. Ziklag is called winding because the road that gets there winds. It goes up and it goes down. It undulates as it moves throughout the countryside. David has got to travel back this road to get home. The place he's called home for the last year. Do you want to know something interesting about Ziklag? In the Jewish language, Ziklag is interpreted for the word we use in slang. And the word is zilch. It's where we get the word zilch from. David is living in a town that literally means less than nothing. And it's a winding town. And, and David and his men are, are on their way back, six days on their foot. And, and as, they, as they come to the last hill that ascends up and then into the valley of Ziklag, they smell smoke in the air. The men quickly assume the wives must have heard of their returning and they must be making a big feast. And, and the men are excited. You know how it is when, you, when you've been traveling a long time and you're almost there, you almost get home, right? You, you tell the kids to hold it. You tell the kids to shut up. You, you tell them, I'm just driving through, right? You, you're almost there. They're, they're about to ascend the hill. They smell smoke in the air. They assume a feast has been prepared. The men are exhausted. They, they work so hard to get here. And one man clears the top of the hill. He's the first one to get there, probably younger, had a little more energy than the others. And he screams out, no! We pick up in chapter 30, verse 1. The Bible says this. David and his men reached Ziklag on the third day. Now the Amalekites, who they had been attacking, raided Ziklag. And they attacked it, and they burned it. There's the smell of smoke in the air. They had taken captive all the women and everyone else in it, both young and old. They killed none of them, but they carried them off. This is the moment. I mean, I mean everything that David has ever wanted is lost. It's all lost. And, and in David, as he clears the ridge and he looks down and he realizes that his home was right over there and it no longer exists, all the men rush down the hill, 600 warriors. And the Bible says in verse 4 that the men wept so bitterly that they had no strength left. They wept aloud. What does it take for a warrior? What does it take for a man who's got a weapon in his hand to drop it and bawl like a baby? It takes it when you've lost everything. The, the place is ashes. There's, there's nothing left. Some burning embers. The, the smell of smoke now that, that was so warming to them when they were outside the city gates is now a stench to them. They can't believe what they're smelling. They can't believe what they're experiencing. Everything they've ever had 
is completely lost. All their possessions have been burned and, and, and their wives and their children are gone. The only way they know their wives and children are not dead is I'm sure a scout went out and he noticed the tracks heading south. He yells out, it's the Amalekites. They've done this to us. They know who it is. It's their enemy. But they've taken with them our wives and our children. Here in this moment, with everything lost, David has to do what most of us have to do. You've got to take some inventory on what you got left, right? You've got to look at what you got. It looks like everything is lost, right? But you've got to stop and, and look at what you, what you got left. Sometimes it's about perspective. See, because, because for the men, they don't see how much they got left. David, David's got to see what he's got left. Verse 8 of 1 Samuel 30 is interesting because the Bible says that David inquired of the Lord and he asked the Lord two questions. He said, shall I pursue them and will I overtake them? Verse 9, God says, absolutely, go get them, boy. Now the reason why I bring up verses 8 and 9 is because a student of God's word, I am bothered by something that I believe parallels our lives and for a moment, you're going to get real uncomfortable, okay? I'm just forewarning you. But what I find interesting about 1 Samuel chapter 30, verses 8 and 9 is simply this. That if you read your Bibles, you read chapter 27, you read chapter 28, you read chapter 29, and you read the first seven verses of chapter 30. Do you know what we'll find to be true? David has not once inquired of the Lord. From the time that David thought to himself that the best thing he could do was escape to the land of the Philistines, David hasn't spoken to the Lord. We have no record of it. Now, it doesn't mean that David hadn't done it, but I'm going to tell you right now, and Scripture tells us often that David spoke with God. Often David communicated with God. But for the last period of time, in the last year of David's life, he ain't had much contact with God. And I'm telling you right now, how many of our problems that, that we've gotten ourselves into is because we left God out of? Did you hear me? How many of the problems we've gotten ourselves into is because we've left God out of? I don't know how you manage it. I don't know how you work it out in your, in your life. But I'm going to tell you right now, I realize that most of the problems I've gotten myself into have been because I've left God out of. Somehow along the way, David never prayed about whether he should go to Philistine country. You know what? If he would have prayed, God would have said, no, stick it out. David would have never chosen the town of Ziklag, been assigned there, a place that means less than zero. It would have never happened if he would have asked God first. David would have never established the town and, and brought his wives and the men's wives and had children and, and established this city, this village. It would have never gotten burned. Their wives would have never been taken away. Everything would have not been destroyed if he'd only inquired of God. David now, in the midst of losing absolutely everything, all he's got left is God. And here's the beauty, folks, is that no matter what mistakes you've made, because you've left God out of it, God has always been there for you. God will never leave you nor forsake you, and God will never turn away from you. So much of our hope is dashed in the fact that we believe that, that the lies are true. We believe that we're, we're absolutely messed up. We, we can't go any further. How, how am I ever going to redeem what I've done to myself? The reality is God redeems your days. Here's the deal. I want you to understand something, though. And, and, and I'm trying to talk to the younger uh, people in the room. Learn from us old folks, okay? Learn from us because we've made the mistakes. You include God in everything you do from the start. Don't you dare date anybody unless you pray about it first and ask God, God, is this the one I should date? If God's silent, you stay silent. You, you don't say a thing to him. You know how God's speaking when he gives you that sense of peace. You'll know you're supposed to go for it. You ought to pray about the jobs you're taking. You ought to pray about the school you're looking at going to. You ought to pray about the person you're dating right now and ask God, God, is this the one? I promise you, God will give you clarity. He will make it sense to you. He will let you know his yes is yes and his no is always silence. His no is always real clear because you don't feel nothing. And if God doesn't want you to feel nothing, then you shouldn't feel nothing towards them. Sorry for breaking up your relationship today, but welcome to Westside. <laughs> you ought to pray first. Listen, listen, God doesn't want to be the second or third phone call you make. God wants to be the only call you make. God doesn't want to be your plan B. He wants to be your only plan. God doesn't want to be your friend on Facebook. God wants your face in his book. That's the bottom line for what happens. 
There comes a point when we got to focus ourselves down and say, listen, David, you would have never been here, my friend. You would have never gotten to Ziklag. You would have never lost your wife and your children. You would have never had everything burned if you only would have inquired of the Lord first. But I love that God said, absolutely, boy, go get them. I like that God is still for us when man's against us. And so, so we got this situation where, where David is about to take off. And let me explain this to you. That, that, that I wonder how many times God has diminished our life to less just so we would understand what really is more. See, because the less you have, the more valuable it becomes. Did you hear me? The less you have, the more valuable it becomes. And I wonder if why God keeps taking things out of your life, I wonder if the reason why God keeps removing things from your life is because the less you have, then the more valuable He becomes to you. Listen, if you keep putting God on a shelf, if you keep excusing God, if you keep, if you keep ignoring Him, He's going to make Himself real known. And the less you have, if it's only God, the more valuable He becomes. Listen, I wonder how many times in our lives that we've given the credit to the devil and said, well, the devil's just trying me today. The devil's just making a mess out of my life. I wonder how many times it's God. I wonder how many times it's really God who's, who's testing you. L understand this. You don't know how smart you are until you take the test. You don't know how strong you are until you bear the weight. You don't know how fast you are until you have to run for your life. You don't know how valuable a life is until you've got to save one that you love. You don't know that God is all you need until God is all you got. And I'm telling you, we've got to get to the point where we know God is all we got to have. But here's the deal. My time's running out. Let me look at verse 1. I want to show you the real key to why I got all passionate today. Look at verse 1. The first 10 words is the key. The verse 1 says this. David and his men reached Ziklag on the third day. And when I read that, I, 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 was, I was amazed because I began to realize that there's symbolism behind the third day. In the Bible, the third day comes up often. It says in Genesis chapter 1 that on the third day, God parted the, the, the land from the sea and created vegetation. In Genesis chapter 2, it said on the, or 22, on the third day, Abraham and his son Isaac went up on the mountain and, and Abraham said to Isaac, listen, we're going to go up there and worship. And then we shall return home. And they did. In Genesis 42, it says, And on the third day, Joseph released his brothers from the Egyptian prison. It said in, in Exodus chapter 19, on, on the third day, God gave to Moses the Ten Commandments. In Joshua chapter 1, it says, On the third day, the Israelites consecrated themselves and they crossed the Jordan River into the Promised Land. In Jonah chapter 1, it says, On the third day, Jonah was expelled from the belly of the whale and he went on to preach the gospel in Nineveh. It says in, in, in Esther chapter 4, on the third day, Esther appealed to the king for the release of her people. I could go on and on about what happens on the third day, but you all know where I'm going, right? It was on the third day that Jesus rolled the stone away and he walked out of the grave alive and our Savior was redeemed and ransomed. It was on the third day. Here's the deal. On David's calendar, the third day is the worst day of his life when he saw everything destroyed. The third day was the worst day of his life on his calendar. But on God's calendar, the third day is always a day of hope and resurrection. This is not over. It does not end here. God is going to redeem what you have lost. You'll get it back. Would you stand? Let's go in. Thank you for joining us at Westside Community Church. We hope to see you at one of our Sunday services at 9 or 11 a.m.